You may be seated. If you believe that, say amen. amen. He is a good, good father. And he's given us this good, good cold weather. <laughs> so we'll just praise the Lord. Amen. Lord knoweth how to give and how to take away. He took away the warmth for a while, but I'm sure it'll be 75 tomorrow. It's Houston, you know. But it's good to see you this morning. We're in the middle of a series, really it's the second part of the, of the sermon series having to do with our spiritual armor and the spiritual battle that we're in. And uh, last week we did an introduction to this from Ephesians chapter 6 on the invisible war. I'll update you a little bit on that in just a moment. But today we're looking at the next part of this message on the spiritual war and the invisible war is, has to do with suiting up and being prepared for the battle that's going on. So let's look and review real quick at some of the verses we looked at, and I want to catch us up, and then we'll move on from there. But uh, one thing I will tell you before I read this. Satan doesn't want you to hear this today. <laughs> Devil doesn't want you to hear this. And there are some principles here today that if you don't know these things, reality, it, this can transform your life. Your present circumstances can be radically transformed. Your whole disposition can be transformed. Just some basic principles of the Word of God. And it may be that we do know these and it's just need reminding. Amen? Because they certainly will slip in time. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might and put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 goes on to say, this struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, since this is true, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, then you stand firm. All right. Now, last week we dealt pretty much specifically with this war and this spiritual struggle. And we talked about this struggle that it is, it is an invisible struggle. It's not in the flesh and blood. We're not arm wrestling the devil, all right? This is a, it's a, an invisible war. We talked about our enemy. We talked about our wardrobe a little bit and the weapons of this warfare. If you just kind of feel that the Christian life is a, is a matter of exertion, you know, if we can just exert enough energy and have enough determination, if that's where your understanding is, then you certainly, uh, you're going to, you don't understand, one, the nature of the campaign itself, this spiritual campaign, and you're not going to be able to resist the fiery darts of the evil one that it talks a little bit later in this passage, nor will you be able to withstand the schemes of the enemy in your life. We've given uh, last week in th those verses 11 and 12 a, a fourfold description. It's even broadened in other places of Scripture. It's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 21 of Ephesians as well about these spiritual forces of wickedness, these rulers, these powers, the principalities they're called in these passages. Try to, to categorize them a little bit last week, but you, you really can't categorize them. It's kind of a guessing game at that point. But they are demonic forces. They're fallen angels. These are when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he took with him one third of the heavenly host. And these are descriptions of those fallen angels, these, these demonic powers. And as we talked about the reality of them, some people get a little scared. There's no reason to. But you need, need to understand that these entities and these forces and these, these individual demons, you know, which are called the those workers of this darkness or the spiritual forces of evil, they are under the dominion, the control of Satan himself, all right? They form a united front. In fact, verse 12 is kind of expansion of the reference to the devil's schemes, you know, in verse 11, he talks about them there. And so 12, he's talking about he uses these demons to carry out those plans and, and those schemes. We talked about those schemes are, are strategical steps of action that he takes against your life. Goal number one is to keep you from knowing God. If it can't succeed in that goal, it's number two is if you come to Christ, he doesn't want you to really know God on a deeper, more intimate level. You may have a relationship established, but he certainly doesn't want that growing into a place of maturity in your life. He wants to keep you in bondage. He wants to keep your life a, a life of frustration where you don't experience the peace of God and the promises of God, the joy of the Lord. They're just absent from your life. And so it, these, these enemies, this, this particular description of enemies, these spiritual beings, uh, they're never really represented as acting independently. Although they act independently, they share a common objective with Satan. And you say, well, what is that objective, Pastor? Well, Jesus laid it out very clearly when he said this, that the devil comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
Now, that's a pretty simple formula for his plan for your life. You may have heard in your past at some point, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Let me give you the flip side of the coin. The devil hates you and wants to ruin your life. He'll steal, he'll kill, he'll destroy, he'll do everything he can to ruin your life. These little demons, they have a common nature, they have a common objective, they have a common method of attacking your life, which necessitates, according to the Word of God, that we understand who we really are in Jesus Christ, and we're prepared to, as he says here, to stand firm. Now, here's the issue. Again, we go back to this little point here about knowing Jesus, how important this is. He doesn't want you to know Christ because once you come to know Christ, you get equipment, you get the power, you get the grace, you get the strength that you're going to need to live your life victoriously in Christ. Prior to meeting Jesus, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you read back a couple chapters in Ephesians, we're in chapter six, go back to chapter two. In chapter two, it describes a person before they meet Christ And it basically just says they're separated from God and that they're under the tyranny of darkness, that they're under the the uh, the leadership of, of the enemy and of Satan. And it says that they're called the children of disobedience. Now, as we tried to break down some of this demonic hierarchy that we looked at last week, we do understand that they are doing everything they can within their spiritual forces and means and abilities to exploit the world system, the cultures, the governments, the social systems to wreak havoc on anything that represents God, his person, his mercy, his son, or his grace. He comes to ruin your family. He comes to ruin your country. He wants to ruin your church. He wants to ruin everything and anything that he possibly can regarding your life, your joy, and your victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're called upon here to be involved in this spiritual, he says, this struggle. He said, we struggle not against principalities and powers. I mean, we struggle against principal powers, not against flesh and blood. What does that mean? Well, one talks about a struggle here. It's, it's not like sitting in a military room somewhere in a secluded place where you're operating a drone and doing drone strikes against the enemy. It's not long distance. It's not like sitting at a missile launch base and launching missiles into the enemy's strongholds. It's not like that at all. This word struggle has to do with wrestling. It's hand-to-hand combat. It's up close and personal. It's moving forward. And the first thing you're going to have to see in all of this is we talk about the spiritual battle in the armor. Says, he says, hey, you're, you can't be passive. This is where you're involved. You're called to be strong. You're called to, to put on. You're called to be able to stand. You're called to take up. You're called to be able to, to take up something else. You're called to resist, to stand firm. Those are just some of the verbs in the few verses that we've read already that the Bible tells us to, to do. We have responsibilities. If you get our e-blast that we mail out weekly, uh, it comes out, out, out of my, my desk and it's to the church. Basic things that are going on, sometimes a word of testimony or devotion or announcements for the pertinently coming up for the next couple of days. If you get that, you'll notice that I did put in there a word about not being passive in our particular fight. Jess Penn Lewis, who years and years ago penned the book called The War on the Saints, he made this statement. He said, the chief condition for the working of evil spirits in human beings apart from sin, that chief condition is passivity. It's an exact opposition to the condition which God requires from his children for his working in them. In other words, Jess Penn Lewis is saying, if you're a child of God, there's no place for passivity because you will be defeated. So you are called on to take measures in your life. You don't have to be afraid of demons. There's nowhere in the word of God where you're advised or I'm advised to be fearful of demonic forces. If you find yourself fearful on the spiritual front, it's probably a sign you've watched too many movies. The Omen, all these other demonic movies that come out. People spinning their heads and throwing up green. All right. You don't have to be afraid of spiritual forces because of who you are in Christ, because of what God has done for you. I think I've said it before that demons are more like germs. I mean, that's pretty much the way they're all around us. I mean, germs are in the water, they're in the food, they're in the air. Everywhere you go, there's germs everywhere you go. And you don't freak out. Germs! All right. Germs, germs. Now, some people that are hypochondriac have a tendency to do that. 
but there's really no need to, to, to freak out. You just take care by proper hygiene and food and rest because, you know, that'll take care of itself. Demons are, are, are kind of like that. You, you need to be aware of their presence. You need to take proper precautions, good spiritual hygiene, amen. But you're never told to be afraid of demons. And if you are, then you're kind of a spiritual hypochondriac. Don't be afraid of them. The only thing that demons have against you as a child of God is their mouth. Do I need to say that again? It's their mouth. The Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. That's what he uses against us. In Jesus Christ, you are protected. As a child of God, you're equipped and you're protected and you're equipped to be able to deal with anything that he might attempt to throw at your life. You say, well, you know, why get involved then if God's got me covered? Because he tells you to be involved. It's like being enlisted in the army or the Marines or whatever it might be, whatever branch of service, and you're actively serving your country. You you don't want to be that soldier who sits there and says, well, my country is the most advanced military power in the world. Why do I need to wear a helmet? Why should I carry a gun? Why do I need any protective gear? I don't need to stand guard, even learn to shoot or fight. That's not true, is it? You're called on your commanding officer to do all those things, to be prepared in battle so that you might strategically win any effort that comes against us. You have a commanding officer. It's General Jesus. It's your heavenly father. And he's called upon you to to stand, to be firm, to put on the armor of God, to pray. All these things are called upon us. We have to take an active part in your walk, in your life on a daily basis. Satan does have a strategy. He wants to move against you individually, personally, in your life. And if you're not going to be vigilant, and if you're not going to be on guard, as Scripture says, and if you're not going to be prepared, then certainly the best you could expect is just to be a prisoner of war and be defeated. And to not have the spiritual grace and joy that the Lord has for your life. So we learn not to be afraid of demons, but we learn that we do have a a, a, a much far more superior power protecting us than what the enemy has to present to us. So that leads us to this part of this series of messages where we talk about the suit up part. You know, that we want to be able to stand. He says, so here, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition, taking up the shield of faith. What's this shield of faith going to do? It's going to extinguish all those flaming missiles of the evil one. What is that? That's all the lies that comes spewing out of his mouth. And you take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now the first, I would say after reading that, we're going to break it down a little bit this morning. But after taking this, I think the first and most important thing about the armor that we need to understand is all this is really just living our life in Jesus Christ, living our life for Jesus Christ, trusting God for his strength and power, resting in his strength and might, and believing that he's available to meet our every need. All the armor points back to Jesus Christ. I was listening on a song, just praising the Lord on the way over here from the other campus this morning, and it was a song that says, love has a name, joy has a name, peace has a name, but basically each course, the name of joy is, is Jesus. The name of my peace is Jesus. The name of love is Jesus. Well, the name of all this armor is Jesus, all right? It all boils down to who Jesus is. Romans puts it this way, chapter 13, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh. Put on Jesus. Wake up daily and say, I'm in Christ. I'm trusting Christ. I'm living for Christ. I'm going to believe him today. I'm going to believe him over anything that the enemy might tell me. I'm going to trust Christ. He says, don't make provision for the flesh. Now, the flesh here, he's talking about your old fallen nature, your old life that wants to rely on itself and not trust God, your old life that wants to pursue whatever the world and the flesh and the devil calls it to do versus this new person that you are in Jesus Christ. One of the great marvelous things about God's work in you and in me is that if any man's in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. One thing about a person who's come to Christ, they are not what they used to be. They are not like they used to be. Things have changed. We have a new life. We have new capacity to see, to understand, to hear. We get a different view now. We can get a heavenly perspective of life instead of this earthly, defeated, downtrodden, demonic view of life. 
By putting off the flesh and putting on Jesus, basically we're taking an attitude now that we realize that Christ is in us, we're in him, we have who we need, we have what we need, we've been given by God everything that we can necessarily have to have victory. But there are some positions we need to take, there are some stands that we need to take. So we put off the the old man, we put on the new man, as he said, in another place. Now the beautiful thing about putting on the new man is, the Bible says in 1 John that the evil one cannot touch us. 1 John 5, 18. He can't touch me in Christ. So I see the importance of daily putting on Jesus Christ and daily putting on this armor. He can't touch me. We put ourselves in Jesus. One of the great passages in Jesus is preparing his disciples for the, the moment where he's going to be rejected and the crucifixion comes and the resurrection follows. In John 14 and 15 and 16, he's getting them all prepared. And you see all these beautiful passages. But one thing he's telling them, he's telling them, hey, the, I'm going to send the comforter. He's going to come. And he's going to convince the world of, of, you know, of judgment and righteousness and truth. And then at one point he says in this chapter in 14, he says, you know, and the wicked one cometh. It's talking about Satan. He comes, but he finds nothing in me. Now, unfortunately, all too often when he comes to us, he finds plenty. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren, right? That's why it's important we have a clear conscience in our life. He can't accuse me of it anymore. It's under the blood of Jesus. I've given over to Christ. I'm following Jesus. But he has nothing in me. So you see the importance of being in Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is my joy. He is my righteousness. He is my faith. He is my sword, which is the word of God. He is the truth. Everything I need is found in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you are complete in him. So we find our strength. And if we look on, as we look over the next few weeks over this armor, let's keep remembering it's not something existential. It's really having to do with my fellowship and my relationship and my commitment in and for Jesus Christ. When he says in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus, don't make provision for the flesh. I think what he's saying here, the flesh, we don't struggle in flesh and blood. Remember we said in Ephesians 6 here? That's not where you're going to find your, your, your strength at, and that's not where you're going to fight this battle at. It's not going to be a matter of you out here saying, I'm going to try it real hard today to be a good Christian, do what God wants me to do. I'm just going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, then fall flat on your face. I don't know about you, it doesn't work for me. But it is saying I'm going to move over here and put on Jesus today, and I'm going to do whatever God calls me to do, tells me to do, leads me to do, because I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I have what I need. I have the strength. I have the power of all that's required of me as a child of God. So let's, let's kind of look at this a little bit closer now when he talks about, and we're just going to cover one aspect of the armor today. Amen. And we're going to talk about this belt of truth, all right, that we're, that, 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 this, this part of the hour. And as you look at this, in fact, he talks about three pieces of equipment that we've already donned, according to Ephesians 14 and 15. As you look at the passage, he says, having, having girded yourself with the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your, your feet with the preparation of the gospel. In other words, these are things that have already been done as he's telling you to stand firm. And he says, then you take up the shield. Then you take up the sword. Then, so he's telling you what you're going to do, but he's also giving you an insight to something that's already happened here. Having girded, having put on, having shod. This is three elements here, three three aspects of the, of the armor here that, that represent something that's already been done. I mean, let me think of it this way. When my wife and I had our children, they're little babies, and maybe you have a baby in your household now, and it's an, there's not too much a child and an infant like that can do. Can't feed themselves hardly, can't protect themselves, can't provide for themselves, but these loving parents are doing all that for them. You know, as a newborn Christian, when I gave my heart and life to Jesus, I was just completely ignorant, all right, of all that God had had done for me. And I'd like like you to know, honestly, folks, I'm probably pretty ignorant still (laughs) of all that God has done. And even though I may know a whole lot because I study a lot and and, and spend a lot of time examining scripture, learned a lot, but I probably don't have an inkling of all God's done for me. Can you imagine where you would be or I would be today had it not been for all these protective measures that God has already put in your life and taken care of you already. Just by grace, just by mercy. He's just provided for you. He's guarded you. He's protected you. You probably wouldn't be here today if he hadn't done that much for you. I mean, it's bad enough when I do the stupid things that I do. 
But how much has the Lord just protected me from and given me by putting me in this relationship? You know, and we say, it says here, this Greek tense is it, it, you, having done these. This refers to an action that's really already been completed before I'm even commanded to do something. So it's like God's done everything for me, even when I didn't know he was doing it. Even before I became informed how to use it, he's taken care of me. You ought to thank God for that kind of mercy that we, you know, that, that God's taken care of us like this. But as we grow in Christ, Christ and as we're becoming more vigilant in our life and we become more aware of the spiritual arena that we stand in every day, then it's important that we learn what God says so we can grow in this grace and we can start being effective in the battle that's going on around us and being used by God in such a real and tremendous way. That's God's desire for your life. Not just to sit in a place of protection, but to go out and make a difference and to move forward and to stop what Satan's been radically doing in the world all around us, in our hearts and homes and lives and families and countries and the world. How much how much more would be accomplished in the kingdom of God if we just learn these simple biblical principles that God has given us in Scripture, that we go out and we can make a difference and we can do some things. And he starts here about this belt of truth. It was this girdle, all right? And this was obviously the most practical part of all of the weaponry or all the, the, the materials that God has given us. This, this belt of truth, and as you see it in pictures like you have on the screen, day, it looks like it's on the outside. But the truth of the matter is, the guard, this one that's girding us here, this is where most likely the belt itself would be hidden. But what you would see would come out would be these, these things would hang down from it. They would be either bronze or, or copper or, or leather, kind of like an apron, which hang out underneath. They would protect the, the groin and the loins and, the, and, the, and, and all the way at least down to the, the middle part of your thighs. It was the idea here, though, was that you were fastening up and you're girding everything together. It's like pulling up your core strength here. And it, it's strapped on, it's strapped tight. The tunic that would be worn many times would go down below the knee or to the knee. That would be taken and pulled around and tucked into this. So there's nothing dangling, nothing to get entangled in. It, it's preparing you, all right? It, it was, it's a unique piece of equipment that pulls and binds everything thing together and protects you in this part of your, of your life, in this part of your physical being, especially in this part of your spiritual being, in the spiritual warfare part of it. The idea of fashioning everything together and tying up tight and holding everything together has to do with them. an understanding that you're going to be entering into vigorous activity and you don't want anything binding you up, holding you back. It's like the runner, when he talks about that we're in this race, he's, he said, we, we lay aside every encumbrance, the things that would hinder us in the running process. That's what's happening here in battle. Anything that might tangle me up, anything that might get in the way, it's going to be tightened down. I will have a place to put my sword. I will have a place to put a knife if I need whatever else I want to attach to it. I can do that. But the most important thing is it's all binding up the core strength of everything that's going on. And what's it called? It's called the belt of truth. Now, we've already said, Jesus said, I am the way, the, the truth, and the life. So what is he saying here? All that you're going to do in preparation for battle is, is based upon truth. If you, want to have, if you want to have victory in your life, it's going to be based upon truth. If you're going to go to war in your life, you need to understand truth. You need to not only believe the truth, you have to choose the truth, you have to confess the truth. Why? Because Satan's primary weapon against each and every one of us is the same. It's a lie. He spews out one lie after another. That's the way he works. And if he can disable you by believing a lie, he's won the battle in your life. How often are we so prone, though, so easily duped and deceived into believing a lie that comes to the enemy? Now, where does he lie? How does he lie? Well, it doesn't take a lot of scripture to realize that the mind becomes the battleground, all right, in this spiritual arena. He plants thoughts. He plants ideas. He plants suggestions into our mind. Every temptation begins with a thought, right? It all starts there. And it's what we do. That's why it's important that we have this transformed mind in Christ Jesus that he's given us when we're saved. It's what we do with these thoughts and what, how we respond to what he's told us. It can be as simple as... Hearing a sermon today, and God speaks to your heart and says, you know, you need to do this. Satan immediately comes and says, you can't do that. And what do you do? You mimic it. You murmur it. You parrot it. You say, I can't do that. 
So he says, it's not going to work out for you. And you say, it's not going to work out for me. Satan says something like, you know, uh, you, you know, you, you, you just, you, you just, I, you, you heard that pastor say you ought to forgive, but you know, you really can't forgive. That was just too big an offense. Oh, I can't forgive. That was just too big an offense. Simplest little lies, so easily believed. You know, I, I can't help myself. He says it to you. You can't help yourself. And then he waits and you say, I can't help myself. You're no good at this. I'm no good at this. You never amount to anything. I'm never going to amount to anything. You're just, you're worthless. You know what? I'm just worthless. You see how it works? That's why the Bible later on, as is, is, is Paul's addressing the church, he says, you bring into captivity every thought. Why? Because that's where the thoughts come. I just, you know, it's like, it's like the person with, with addictions in their life. They say stuff like, well, that's just the way I am. I mean, where'd they get that from? Satan told them that. That's just the way I am. I'll never overcome this. Where, where'd you hear that? I brewed that up by myself. You think you brewed it up? You didn't have to brew it up by yourself. Satan had already planted there. I, well, I just need. Who told you that? There's a point where truth comes in and opposes the lie. And what you do is you stand firmly on the truth, whatever that is. And that truth comes from the word of God. Thy word is truth. This is, this is a beautiful thing. I mean, and, and I've used that word four times now. I know. Beautiful. Because this only way I can describe truth. It's, it, it, well, I went out to the, our building site this week a couple of times. And one time when I was out there, I noticed some guys are putting up the, the metal studs they're going to screw the sheetrock to for the walls, the interior walls. And they're putting them all around the outside, uh, inside, outside walls of, of the inside building, all right? And they're going in there. And I noticed that each of these guys is working had a small level in his hand. Y'all know what that is, little bubble levels, you know. And so they'd put it up, measure it, and screw it in. Put it up, measure it, and screw it in. Now, why are they doing that? Because they like it to be straight. They want it to support the weight properly. There's so much involved in making sure that it's, well, which we would use this terminology, making sure that it's true. The walls need to be true. When they put in the, the support that was the, the major support for the building, they had to bring those big steel beams up and they put levels on them to make sure they were true. And so there's a level which helps us determine if it's really straight or not. You have a level that God has placed in your life to determine if things are correct or incorrect. And that is the word of God. It is the truth. This is the true truth, all right? It's not, well, it's just truth as you see it. No, no, no. There's no room for that. Because everybody sees it differently. That's why the Bible says it's not for private or personal interpretation. What does that mean? When the Bible speaks of itself like that, in other words, God, it, God just told you, it, it's very clear, it means what it says and says what it means. And it's true. It can be relied upon. It can be trusted because it's true. God put his level up against it, and it, it's right. It's accurate. There's nothing wrong with it. You can believe the word of God. You can believe the truth of the word of God because it is, it's true truth. Now, the, when the Bible uses this word about the belt of truth, it comes from a Greek word, aletheia. And this word has to do, it refers to the, an attitude of truthfulness, the character of truthfulness, the accuracy of truthfulness, the quality of truthfulness. All those things come into mind in this word. In other words, it's really true. It's true truth. It's not man-made truth. It's not, I think and hope, opinionated truth. It's the truth as reality is. It's not truth as man sees it. It's the truth as God has set it into action. This is what happens. This is true. It's true that if you jump off this building, the forces of gravity are going to pull you down and you're going to break something or die. That's true. So I don't believe it. Jump off. We'll come witness right after church. All right. That's just, it's been set in, there's this law and operation called gravity. It's true. Now you can overcome that law with other laws, the law of aerodynamics, all right? And that's a higher, that although gravity doesn't, doesn't change gravity, it's still true. But the law of aerodynamics will allow you to fly at least for a little while until you run out of fuel. And then what happens? Gravity comes right back into play. Now, the truth of God's word is what holds us in our very core and what strengthens us and pulls it all together and gives us the grace and the power we need to be able to stand. And he says the Christian is to gird himself with truth. The word of God, this attitude of faith upon the word of God. 
Now, it goes beyond just saying, I believe the Bible. This means there's an application of truth because you're putting it on. This application of truth means I will be truthful. I mean, it's the mark of the sincere believer, the true believer, who, who basically would resist a lie. You know, if, if it's the truth, I'm in. If it's a lie, count me out. If it's true, count me in. So I want to believe what's truth. What happens in our life, though, is we begin to backslide. We begin to rebel. We begin to believe a lie. And we begin to forsake the truth. Hypocrisy enters in. Well, that's a, hypocrisy is a picture of a lie. It's not true, is it? It's pretense. It's pretending to be something that you're not. Putting on a face, a sham. And he's saying here, you need to be truthful with the truth and with God's word. You need to be honest with it, with yourself. Well, that's the first battle of truth, I believe. Can I be honest with myself? A lot of people refuse to be honest with themselves. We have a much higher opinion of ourselves than we probably ought to have. Our estimation of, a, of height and glory and wonder shouldn't be in me, it should be in God. But I won't be honest with myself. I'll have a tendency to overlook the lie or believe the lie or excuse the lie or justify my situation. Well, you have to realize I'm not as bad as Brother Tim. <laughs> he may say, I'm not as bad as Brother Joe. Hey, what's happened here? When somebody's building my house and my buildings, I want them to use a true measure. Brother Tim's not the measure. Brother Joe's not the measure. Jesus is the measure. So the Bible says when you compare yourselves with one another, you become foolish. Why? What, what could be more foolish than believing a lie? They're not the measure. They're not going to give me an accurate picture of things the way it should be. Now, we should be walking in truth so that people see Jesus in us. But ultimately, Jesus is the standard bearer. He is the standard, not just the bearer. Amen? And so if we're going to be serious, then we have to be honest with ourselves. What am I justifying in my life? What have I excused in my life? What have I rationalized in my life? What have I blamed somebody else for in my life? Why can't I just take an honest look at myself and say, oh, God, help me. I'm a sinner in need. And I'll never be able to do this without you. We, won't be honest with, we want to be honest with each other. We're too busy trying to impress each other, wondering about what everybody thinks about us. You've heard what I've said about that on multiple occasions. You quit wondering what everybody thinks about you because they're not. <laughs> Why not? Because they're thinking about themselves. Isn't that right? Don't worry about what people think about you. So quit trying to and try to impress and make up stuff, embellish the truth or whatever. It's called exaggeration, a little white lie. Hey, there's no color scheme with lying. It's just a lie. And if you tell lies, guess what? You're a You said it, I didn't. I'm trying to be nice here. Truth. Truthful with myself. Truthful with others. How often have we tried to impress people? And what's the reason behind it? Pride gets in our way. And we choose to believe lies. That it's really important that I come across this way. How about just love Jesus and be who God made me to be? How about just truthful with God? God's made it very clear with us. How important, if I'm going to step into this spiritual arena, and it's all around me already. Is it important that I be prepared for this battle by having my loins girt about with truth? If I'm going to be able to stand and stand firm, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy when he said this, and there's no soldier in active service is going to entangle himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he might please the one who has enlisted him. In other words, I don't need to be involved with all that sham, what the world thinks and what the world does and what's popular and what's accepted and what's the latest and greatest. Don't entangle myself with that stuff. Stay, keep, keep all those entanglements tacked, tucked into your belt of truth. That you're just relying on the Lord Jesus Christ. How important that is for us if we're going to be what God's called us to do. Can I be honest? With Jesus, with his word, with truth, and with myself and with you. That's the most important thing. I, I think that... Bottom line here, and don't misunderstand this statement. I believe that being girded with, with truth is primarily has to do with that self-discipline of total commitment. Now, what I say, don't misunderstand this. Don't think that your total commitment is what wins the war. You're not, it's not your strength, it's his strength. It's in surrendering that I experience his strength. When he says Stir, stand firm in the strength of his might, it means that I'm yielding myself over to him and standing there. Do you understand that? 
It's an act of faith, but it has to do with a, a commitment of, 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 of surrender. Tim's been preaching out of Romans where he talks about presenting yourself as a living sacrifice. That's the whole idea. It's, I'm, I'm yours, God. My life belongs to you. Anything I have has come from you. You're my all in all. So I am surrendering. It, it, it activates, so to say. That surrender activates the presence and the power and the grace of God on your life. It, it solidifies. It puts me beyond just trusting my own strength anymore. Say, I believe in God. And I'm trusting his word is going to secure me and hold me together and keep me together in all these situations. But it's not going to be done without surrender. It's not going to be done without a commitment to truth in my own life. So for me to be girded means I'm committing myself to the truth. I don't know how many of you are watching the Olympics. I'm catching some of them off and on over the weekend. And I've watched, interestingly enough, to see some people who were not even supposed to get on the medal stand win the gold. What happened? They're not better than the other person. I mean, the announcers went through 45 minutes to tell us how they weren't going to get it. And it's always fun to watch that guy come up and win it or that girl come up and win it. What was it? And I don't think it necessarily had to do with their, their great abilities and skills. It had to do with a lack of determination and desire. Winning in sports. Anybody that's been an athlete pretty much knows that winning in sports is often, to be, is the, often the direct result of desire that led to that preparation and, and that maximum effort. And all too often, Christians are just desireless, passionless, because they've bought into the lie. They says, oh, I'll go to church. and I mean, they've got it all figured out. I'm right with God. How do you know you're right with God? Oh, I read my Bible this week. I gave some money. I prayed to prayer. I left a gospel track. I'm really right with God. That's just legalism. We ought to do all those things. But to think that those things make me right with God, is a, that, that doesn't work. What makes me right with God is God. <laughs> Living in him, enjoying him, and fellowship with him. Enjoying the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. And not buying into the lie. Staying true to the truth. It's, it's, it's the army, it's the team, it's the individual who wins in the Christian life who's just true to the commander. Who's pursuing the commander. Who loves the commander. Not the one who necessarily has the greatest army or the best skill or the great talent. I was reading last night, and Kathy asked me, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading a commentary. But you've already prepared your sermon. I said, well, I, that's, that's true. Because what I do when I, when I in the way I do sermon preparation is when the Lord's led me to a specific area of scripture that I'm preaching on, I'll read that. I'll re read it repeatedly. Many times I just spend a lot of time memorizing. And at night when going to bed, I'll meditate on that particular passage during the week. And I may wake up in the middle of the night and make some notes and put it on the table beside me. And then when I come in and sit down and have time for study in the office, I'm, I'm going back to those scriptures and I'm just preparing and writing and writing and writing and writing things and then throw out things and put some things in and and just a lot of preparation. When I'm usually finished with my notes, I'll go back and start reading commentaries by theologians on different topics. One, it kind of shows me, am I a complete idiot or not? I mean, <laughs> but it, there's just, it, you know, by the way, any preacher that tells you he doesn't use other people's materials is a liar, okay? Uh, there's no new thing under the sun. We're all sharing what God's given us, amen? But I don't, I, don't, I don't do well preaching other people's sermon, trying to take their notes and preach a sermon word for word or something. It just doesn't work well. You don't receive it, and I don't enjoy it, all right? But, but when I study, so last night, as I'm reading, it's just, it's just kind of adding, salting the sermon, you know, with any particular thoughts that might come in. But I did write this down and, and copy this because it was so good. I was reading out of John MacArthur's commentary on Ephesians, and he made this statement. He said, <clears throat> he said some years ago, I was told of a young Jewish man from the United States who decided he wanted to go to Israel and live there. He said, after working there for two years, they required him to serve in the army for a given period of time or go back home. He decided to join the army. Now, his father was a very good friend of an Israeli general who at first was afraid that his son would use that friendship to secure some kind of easy assignment by going to the general and requesting something easier. He did go to the general. Instead, he said, sir, my present duty is too easy. I want to be in the finest, most strategic, diligent, difficult regiment in the whole army. Commenting on that spirit of dedication, the general said, people think, Israelis are so successful at war because we're super people or have some kind of super intellect or super strength. But our success is not built on any of those things. It's built on commitment. Unreserved, sacrificial commitment. 
Now, obviously, God has intervened for Israel in so many cases. Our commitment is to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. It should be unreserved. It should be all out. It should be all in for Jesus Christ. If we're going to be gird with this belt of truth, it means that we're going to have to say, there's really no place in my life for compromise because that's built on lies. There's no place for just settling in and, and to mediocrity because that's really just built on lies. There's no place for spiritual deadness or being lethargic in my spiritual life or being indifferent or being half-hearted. I can't let those lies creep into my life. What difference does it make? Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. That's are all lies. And we have to come back to the truth. When Satan says to you, you know, you're just, it's just not going to work for you. Then you stand on the truth and you say, that's not true. The truth says that he which began a good work in me, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. Satan comes with lie after lie after lie daily to every one of our lives. We're not, we're not immune from that. But as we're prepared and as we understand truth and we're embracing truth and we're not so exposed to those lies because we're ready to meet them. Jesus in dealing with 40 days of fasting and, and struggling in the wilderness with the devil. Three occasions in that struggle we have recorded in scripture. Who knows how many there were in that 40 day period of time. But the scripture is for 40 days there was a struggle going on. And three times Satan comes with accusations and Jesus' response in each one of them was this. It is written. In other words, the truth is that's how you answer the devil. The truth is, it's written. You're no good. Well, the truth is that I'm in Christ. The truth is you're not going to make it. The truth is I'm in Christ, so I've already made it. You know? The truth is it's not going to work out. Not what the Bible says. The truth is your kids are not going to get robbed of God. The truth is you're not going to make it financially. The truth is, that's not the truth. You know what the truth is. Why? Because you have a level. You can hold that up against it. Nope, that doesn't measure that doesn't work. That's not right. So the rule of behavior for you and for me is, if it's truth, count me in. If it's not the truth, count me out. And the more I learn to live by the truth, the more, the more I love the truth. If I start regarding the truth as some kind of horrible requirement, some kind of horrible law, some kind of strict standard, and I've missed the mark. I want to grow in truth. I want to live the truth. We don't have to cover up when we're walking the truth. We don't have to worry about this clear conscience because we're living our life according to truth. We don't have to worry about a bad conscience or a guilty conscience. We're going to dislodge the lies in our life by what? By the truth of God's word. Remember, Satan is the father of what? Lies. God is the God of all truth. So do not let your enemy deceive you into believing a lie that he can control your life in any area of your life. When he does that, you stand. He says, you have to, or you should, or you're going to do this, or you're going to live this way. You're going to think this way. You're going to stand and say, hey, you have no more authority in my life. The Bible says I'm no longer a slave to sin. The truth is, it is written, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I don't have to. Now, I'll be honest with you, devil. I may want to. <laughs> My flesh might want to, but I don't have to. And you preoccupy yourself with the truth and quit deliberating with the devil about his lies. Believe the truth. John 7, 5, 17, again, some of these last words of Jesus in his priestly prayer with his disciples. He's talking to his father. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of this world. So sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. That's where we stand. It's the light of truth that dislodges the lies of Satan. It's the light of truth that runs out the darkness. I love 1 John. That first chapter is so impactful and so powerful. When John is telling the church, hey, listen, please understand this message we're sharing with you. It's the message that we've seen and we've heard and we've touched touched and tasted. And the message is that God is light and he wants to fellowship with you. He wants to fellowship with you. And our fellowship is with him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he goes on, he starts talking about truth. He says, hey, if you're going to walk in that light, you can't live a lie. If you say you have fellowship with him, yet you walk in darkness, 
then you do not practice the truth and you lie. In other words, not only do you speak a lie because you're saying, I'm walking with God, I'm in fellowship, but you're not because there's darkness in your life, there's sin in your life, there's lies you believed in your life. And what's happening? You're just lying. And not only are you lying, he says, you do not the truth. So you tell a lie, you live a lie. Next verse says, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we can have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. In other words, if I walk in the light, I have fellowship with God. What's that mean? Embrace the truth. Believe the truth. Then you're in the light. Well, what if I don't? And I'm over here in darkness. But he said, if I walk with him, and here's the thing about it. I always, when I first read this as a young believer, I was trying to make sense of the verse. He says, if we have fellow, walk in the light with him, we have fellowship with him, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin. Excuse me. If we walk in the light, see in the light, we have fellowship, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Excuse me. I'm trying to put these pieces together. And I realize, oh, stupid, get in the light. You're going to see the things that are wrong. You'll see the lies you believe. But you have the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all sin. That, that is such a powerful verse. That next verse says, say, he said, so if we say we have no sin, we're just deceiving ourselves and truth is not in us. Did you catch that? We, we're not being honest with the truth. But here's the beautiful thing. Again, it is beautiful <laughs> that we believe the truth and trust God and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us of the error, of the lies, of the dishonesty, of the hypocrisy, of the sham that we so easily embrace in our life. And I think most of you would know that next verse, verse 9 of chapter 1, which says, but if we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a great promise. What a glorious promise. Put on the belt of truth. Let it be the thing that holds your whole core of your life together. I'm not going to live by lies which thrust me into darkness. I'm going to step in the light and let God's light shine. And if it shines on a blemish, I'm going to put it out there before God and ask him to cleanse me. If it shines on a failure, I'm going to ask God to cleanse me. If it shines on rebelliousness, I'm going to ask God. If it shines on some hypocrisy in my life. It's so easy in this culture we live in. This is such a lying world. <laughs> and there's no, un it's, it's understandable. People lie all the time, don't even think. You ever notice that? They just tell life, 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 and it's just, it's just a part of their life. Because the God of this world, little g, God, is a liar. Let's be honest. Let's walk in the power of a clear conscience. Let's live in the light of truth and see the glory of God manifest on our life in great grace and great power. Put on the belt of truth. And thank God you have it already. Now live by it. Fasten it tight. Hold on. Because this is where you're going to stand. And this is how you're going to stand firm. It's a child of light and a child of truth. Let's stand with our heads bowed today.